this, this an idea that essentially generalizes non-interference and gives us this ability to talk about adversary influence on the uh, declassifications that happen. And this, <clears throat> this is a, a, a very useful thing that, that, uh, that the, the JIT implementation supports. Uh, so, and then when you turn on the flag that, that checks it, then uh, you get a whole new set of uh, uh, security warnings to worry about. Um, um, the thing that's for a long time bothered me was that there was this really nice confidentiality, integrity, duality that uh, Viva identified. And robust declassification breaks that duality. And you know, I, I uh, like symmetry as much as the next person. And so when, so when this beautiful symmetry breaks, it made, it made me wonder for a long time, OK, like, what's, uh, why is it broken? And, and could we get it back to that question? Could you write it out here? Yes, I could. Um, <clears throat> so, so actually, it took a long time, like about 15 years. Uh, but then uh, we realized that in fact, there was a way to restore that duality and restore that symmetry. So we identified a dual to robust classification, which we call transparent endorsement. So this is, which will abbreviate is TE. So this is a condition that constrains the way that you can use endorsement in a, a way that's symmetrical to the way that robust declassification constrains the way that you're allowed to use declassification. And so like robust declassification, it's another for safety property that your, uh, that whatever your security policies are, that you really should satisfy. So to give you a, a justification to this, let me write a little example that breaks transparent endorsement. And actually, it's the same example that I showed you uh, last time, except now, uh, which was that password checker example. But now I'm going to write out the password checker example in a way that satisfies robust classification, unlike the previous version. <clears throat> OK, so here's the example. We'll have, oh, let me actually uh, give you a, a lattice to think about. It's the same lattice that I drew last time. So we have integrity going down to the right, confidentiality going up to the right. We have some low security principle L, untrusted principle L, and sometimes an untrusted label, and a really trusted label H, which corresponds to lots of integrity and confidentiality. And then we have high integrity but no confidentiality and high confidentiality, but no uh, integrity. It just the lattice. Okay. So now I'm going to try to write out a password checker using these labels. So the password checker will have a password. <laughs> and the password is clearly something that should be secret and also trusted. So let's give that the label H. OK. And now we want to check the password for the function. And it is going to return a result. The result of the check password routine needs to be visible to the adversary. It's a Boolean that is uh, going to be public, but it also should be trusted. We want to be able to trust the answer, right? So that's the point of the lens here. OK, now we're supposed to take in a guess. And the question is, what should the label on the guess be? So I think it's not completely obvious, but the guess is coming from the adversary. So it's clearly not a trusted thing. So it probably seems reasonable to say, let's, let's not leak the guess. Uh, we'll treat it as something that is confidential but not trusted. OK. And then we're going to write some code. <clears throat> so the first thing that we're going to need to do, remember that we want to declassify. Um, so let me write this sort of in a backward order. 
we're going to take the, the guess and we're going to compare it to the password. And we want to declassify this thing. Um, but the problem is that the guess is not is low integrity. So we're not going to be able to declassify it directly because robust declassification says you can't declassify untrusted things. That gives the adversary too much power. So we're going to endorse the guess before we do this comparison. So the endorsed guess is a, it will be a trusted and secret guess, a very it from its existing label, which is H right arrow to H. <clears throat> and now, set the result. Actually, maybe I should write the label of the result. So the result then is, the re is going to be the comparison of these two things. Now, it's still not releasable yet because we haven't done any declassification. Just to make it really explicit, I'm bringing that out as a final statement. And so now we can return the result of declassifying this result. It's from H to H left arrow. So this satisfies the rule for robust classification that I gave you last time. But it actually uh, is not as secure as it would like. If you look, at, so our goal here is to capture all of our security requirements through these labels. So if there's anything that we can do with this code that is allowed by the labels but is insecure, then we're going to be sad. So what in particular can we do with this, with this code that would break things? Well, one thing that we might be able to do is call check password on the password directly. Right? So that if the adversary can somehow steer the, the, the password into the check password function, then the, then the check password function will check the password and decide that it's OK. And this is fairly harmless because it's only returning a Boolean, but you could imagine the check password function also has some side effects where it updates some uh, trusted state to say, yes, it's time to do a login or whatever. Okay. So, so this, is, this, is, this is abusing the downgrading that's happening inside of this code. Okay, so where does the fault lie? You know, something's wrong here. And maybe the whole thing is just you know, a mess. We should just give up on information flow. But that would not be my answer. Uh, I think the problem lies right here. The problem is that we did an endorsement of information that was secret and not trusted. And because it was secret, it's perfectly okay by the rules of the informa secure information flow for this password to get sent in as the guess. We can send the password in as the guest because this only requires confidentiality. Uh, this has all the confidentiality this needs, and, and it's okay to send an untrusted, to send trusted information into an untrusted variable. So information flow rules say it's okay. Okay. So, so, the, so the way that we should fix this then is actually to change. Change the signature of this function. So that the guess is not secret, and then we're going to endorse it from L to H. Okay, so, so the problem then is, so once we do that, then we'll have a, a secure uh, program. And, uh, the, but the question is, what is it that, that we were doing wrong in checking endorse? So, in, so we need to update our rule for, our typing rule for endorse, so that it doesn't allow the, the old version of endorse. Okay, so here, here is the rule for transparent endorse. So we call it transparent endorsement because the idea is you, you shouldn't be 
endorsing secrets under certain circumstances. So just like before, I'm going to write a typing rule for a statement that lets us endorse some variable and assign the result into another variable. And so what's, the, <clears throat> what's supposed to happen here? Well, so first, just like before, when we were doing declassification, uh, gamma of y needs to say that it can flow to L1, and L2 needs to flow to gamma x. And then we need some kind of rule for connecting L1 and L2. So L1 needs to flow to L2 with a little bit of help just like with robust declassification. So we get to join something in on the right-hand side. And the thing that we want is an, another operator, like the operator that we saw last time. So last time we introduced this view operator that could, that could map integrity into the corresponding confidentiality that could be classified. So we're going to have another operator, which I'll is a triangle the other direction. So this, this we call the voice operator. And the voice operator is going to map things the other way. So it will take the voice of L1 join PC. Okay, so the voice operator maps confidentiality to a corresponding integrity level. It's capturing what <clears throat> what amount of integrity we're allowed to uh, endorse by, given that we're endorsing some confidential information. Okay, so so that and if you, so if you squint at this, you'll see that it looks a heck of a lot like our rule for robust classification, right? Just a few things have been changed. I think basically the only thing that's been changed, in fact, is this this symbol right here. So that's fairly satisfying, and, you, and, the, and, the, and that operator is going to actually do the dual thing uh, that the uh, view operator did. Okay. So, <clears throat> so in fact, we can now think about what happens if we do both of these things. Right? We have both the robust classification rule and the transparent endorsement rule. Here is the uh, here's sort of the big picture. So I've been, I've been uh, writing down these two safety properties. Last time I said, well, actually, robust classification is enforcing a four safety property. And this is another four safety property. And actually, I could draw one diagram that captures all of this. And that is the following. We now think about four different traces, or sorry, four different states, S11, S21, S12, and S22. And these, <clears throat> along the horizontal axis, uh, these are uh, 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 indistinguishable at level L in the lattice. And on the vertical axis, they're indistinguishable at level H. So remember, L and H are these two points on the lattice. OK, so now, now we say, let's suppose that we have a set of four traces that are related, a set of four states that are related in this way. So then robust classification says if uh, S11 is, uh, behaves, okay, I'm leaving out the, the uh, semantic brackets again. Uh, so if it behaves like S21 with respect to label L, then S12 should behave like S22 with respect to label L. So, so we're saying if, if these two things behave the same way, then these two things should behave the same way. That's robust declassification. And just like last time I said, there is this problem of irrelevant attacks. So we can generalize that. You know, attacks where you know, the, the attacker is being especially stupid. And we can rule those out. We add an, an extra premise here. Uh, so we can say that if we have uh, irrelevant, sorry, let's say relevant influence, and I won't, I won't try to define what that is, but, uh, but, but, but 
that there is that sort of qualification there. And then the, the transparent endorsement condition is going to be completely symmetrical. We're going to again say, we're only going to consider inputs that are relevant for our purposes. And then we're going to <coughs> say that if S11 is equivalent to S12 at the label H, okay, so now we're comparing uh, these guys at label H, then these two have to also behave the same way. So if you if you put both robust classification and transparent endorsement together, we uh, tortured ourselves for a while trying to come up with a good name for this, uh, but what we came up with was non-malleable information. are not able to exploit uh, the uh, downgrading operations that you put in, whether they're endorsements or declassifications. <clears throat> okay, so any questions? Yeah? In that diagram, is it an assumption that S11 and S21 are high Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we're, we're assuming that we have a set of four traces that are related, related like that. So, and then we're saying if that's true, then these implications should hold for the respective security conditions. Okay, so you know, this is a much more symmetrical and, and dual than, than, than what we had before, so that, that's, that's always satisfying. most uh, 
difficult security policy that you would trust that principle to enforce. So, so you can actually interpret a label as a principle and vice versa. And then uh, some people like that, some people don't. Uh, but it makes the notation a lot simpler. So then we have some set of primitive principles, which might be something like Alice, or Bob, or P, or Q. And these are just, so they sort of come from outside. <clears throat> um, we also have principal projections, which I've already been using, sort of sneakily. So we can have a integrity projection, the left arrow, and, and a confidentiality projection, P right arrow. Joins and meets on uh, principles. And when we're thinking about these things as principles, the joins and meets are actually going to operate differently than they do for labels. So, uh, so P and Q represents a principle that has all the powers of P and the powers of Q. And P or Q can think of it as a principle that's uh, kind of the group of both P, P and Q doing something. And if, it, and if this principle does, it only has the power that both P and Q have. So for all, uh, for all P and Q, then uh, P and Q is related to P through a new ordering. And that's also related to P or Q. OK, so this thing here is a trust ordering. It let's us real compare two principles. So the picture then that you should have in your mind, here's our here's our lettuce again. Um, oh let's let's also introduce the, the least powerful principle. I will denote with a bottom symbol. So this is a this is going to be a bottom in the trust ordering. Arguably, it should have been top. Right? And this for compatibility with previous notation, I right? call it bottom. And then the most powerful will be top. Okay, so now I can draw this lattice out. The usual. Lattice that they've been drawing all along. We have an information flow ordering going this way. We have a trust ordering that goes this way. That is, trust increases to the right. At this point, on the far left side, we have the least powerful principle, the lowest thing in the trust ordering. Uh, and, and then we have the lowest powerful principle on the right side. And then down here we have the integrity of the most powerful principle, and at the top we have the confidentiality of the most powerful principle. And then other principles like Alice and Bob, in some sense, lie along the midline here. So if we had some principle like L or H that I was using before, they would be kind of uh, halfway, halfway up the last, uh, along an axis where confidentiality and integrity are equal to each other. So, so why all of this machinery? Well, the nice thing about this is that now it's really easy to flip things from the confidentiality policy to the corresponding integrity policy. And that's what we need for defining <coughs> these operators for transparent endorsement and robust classification. <clears throat> so it, it turns out that there's a normal form for principles. labels as well. And it looks like this. We have some expression A, left arrow, and some expression B, right arrow. And A and B are in conjunctive, um, they're conjunctive normal form uh, expressions over primitive principles. And 
that's not the only normal form we could define, but, but this is a, a perfectly good one. So what this is saying is, you give me any arbitrary label constructed out of joins and meets and pr projections and so forth, and I can always simplify it down into something where I have a pure integrity component and a pure confidentiality component. So there's a, so there's a nice little algebra of principles that we can, we can lean on here. And then, all that we have to do to define the integrity corresponding to confidentiality or vice versa is just, <laughs> is just uh, swap the roles of A and B. So the, uh, the view of A left arrow and B right arrow is just going to be A right arrow. And we're actually going to want to throw in uh, the integrity of the top principle as well to make the rule work out, typing rule work out. And the voice of this label in normal form is just going to be the integrity of B. So you can see we've just taken the, the thing, the confidentiality component and turned it, sorry, the integrity component and turned it into a confidentiality component and vice versa. And in fact, it's actually convenient even to define one operator that does both of these things. Which again, we get a little too cute, um, but that's so we call we call this reflection. So the reflection of the label is just what we get if we exchange the roles of the confidentiality and integrity. Serious problem with building 
hardware securely. And I wanted to circle back to that and tell you a bit about what we've been doing in that space and how what I've been telling you about is relevant. So if you think about what does a modern computing system look like? stack of all kinds of things sitting on top of each other, right? So we, at the top of the stack, we have some application code. And then that's sitting on top of libraries. And those libraries are now sitting on top of an operating system. There might be a hypervisor in there as well. Then the operating system is sitting on top of an instruction set architecture. And the instruction set architecture is itself actually a, a layer of the stack. It's an abstraction, and then we have microarchitecture, which defines the actual implementation. Things like caches and TLBs and branch predictors, all that stuff that doesn't show up in the instructions. <clears throat> so, you know, why is security hard? Well, something that goes wrong at any one of these layers could potentially break security for the entire stack. And what we saw in the, in the attack, in the meltdown attack, is that a problem with, at, at the level of the ISA and the microarchitecture, uh, allows the whole stack to be compromised. Uh, we, can, we can steal information out of the operating system, and then when we have that, we can break everything above it. So, if we, when we build a, a system in layers like this, we, you know, we have to build systems in layers like this because we can't possibly think about the entire system at once. We have to build abstractions. And so the correctness and security are going to depend on having contracts between these different layers. <coughs> this is a black scroll readable, or should I switch? Switch. It might be good to switch. supposed to look like. And what we saw was, with, with Meltdown, is that the, the, the classic notions of a contract, the classic notion of a specification, doesn't work. Right? We need contracts that can talk about the information flow. In general, we, we would like contracts that can capture some, some class of hyper-properties. So whether it's to safety or for safety or maybe something more exotic. Um, so, and not only do we need to be able to have contracts, but these contracts need to be compositional. When we, layer, when we layer the system, we should be able to reason about what's going on underneath. We should be able to say, yes, we built the operating system correctly based on the contract it is with the things below it. And then that lets us reason about the contracts that, that, uh, that the libraries have the operating system and so forth. And in some sense, the problem with our current software stack is that we don't have a compositionality. And that something that's happening down here can kind of bleed up through all of these layers and, and break our security far above. Okay. So, how do we do that? And, and I guess I would argue that one of the reasons why information flow is such an appealing way to think about computer security is that it has a kind of inherent compositionality. That is, if you have two components that are talking to each other and uh, and each one of them is independently enforcing the rules of secure information flow. And they then agree about what happens at the boundary where they're talking to each other. And, and, and that, that boundary is also respecting the, the rules. Then the whole thing is going to naturally enforce the same rules of secure information flow. So that, that's kind of the nice thing about, about information flow. Another way of thinking about it is uh, when you 
use uh, more conventional security mechanisms like access control. Access control, uh, and I'm sure you guys have had the problem where you have a large file system and you have to set permission bits on, on, the, on some of the files. And it's really easy to miss it, you know, some file and get it wrong. Right? And so anywhere in your large file system where you've set this access control policy, you could make a mistake. And nothing really checks that you did it right. There's nothing that really checks that, you're, that the policies are somehow consistent. So the nice thing about information flow is that it's about, it has an inherent transitivity. Right? If, you, if you get a policy wrong, then that generally stops something from flowing into it or stops it from flowing into something that, that you thought it should. And so information flow policies are are just sort of more naturally compositional than, uh, than access control policies. Back in the 80s, people used to talk about discretionary access control, which is the kind of thing that we all, always use all the time, <laughs> versus mandatory access control. And so mandatory access control is intended to be able to capture information flow, and whereas discretionary was you know, something, something weaker than uh, which was what everybody used outside the military context. Okay, so, so that's kind of a high-level view. Now, what does this uh, have to do with secure hardware? Well, I want to, want to talk about the work that we've been doing, thinking about these, these layers down here, and how we can use information flow to get a handle on that. So <laughs> here's, here's a little example, uh, just to get us thinking about that. So, Let's suppose that we have a piece of code that says if some high variable is true, then we'll assign into another high variable the contents of L1, and otherwise we'll assign the contents of L2. Okay, so hopefully this looks completely secure. Right? All we did was we signed some low variables into some high variables. What could possibly go wrong? Right? And now let's assign another low, into another low variable the contents of L1. Again, this looks completely harmless with respect to all the type systems that we've been talking about. Right? But if we have an adversary who is able to observe when updates are done to low variables, this is not secure. Because imagine that H1 is true. Then we're going to execute this line of code. And in a real system, this is going to pull L1 in the cache. Okay, it's really important that that happens, because otherwise we'd be suffering multiple order of magnitude slowdown for, uh, for, for the privilege of accessing memory. And so then this line here is faster if L1, if H1 is true. So if we can time this update to L3, then we're going to learn the, con the value of H1. Okay. So, so this is the timing channel. We'd like to be able to build code in such a way that we don't have these kinds of timing channels. The question is, how do we do that? At the source language level, none, the cache is not a thing. Right? The cache is, a, is, is, is something we really, really, really want to keep below the level of abstraction of our programming language. Life will be very difficult if we have to talk about the cache explicitly. <clears throat> so, so we need a contract that between the layers of the system, in the, in the sense we're, we're really talking about a contract between the instruction set architecture and the microarchitecture. That lets us rule out these kinds of programs. And ideally, then, what that will allow us to do is type check our code, our library code, and our application code, and our operating system code. With respect to this kind of security type system I've been talking about, we can translate it down into an instruction set architecture that knows about labels. And then that can run on top of a microarchitecture, which will be respecting those labels. At that point, we have a full stack that is enforcing security. So that's the dream.
So one paper that we uh, wrote <coughs> a few years ago, uh, this is done by Dan Fung John and uh, Aslan Naskaroff and myself. It's in uh, PLBI 2012. So this was our first attempt to capture a contract between the ISA and a microarchitecture. Our ISA in this case is basically GIMP. So we didn't, we didn't, it's not too real. Uh, but uh, it does define a contract between these things that lets us then reason about information flow at a higher level and be able to rule out uh, timing channels. And actually it rules out other leakage as well because it's going to do all the same stuff we've already been talking about. So it, 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 it rules out leakage uh, you know, storage channels as well. And, uh, and I'm not going to talk about it in, in any detail, but uh, uh, Drew Zagibuelo uh, has a paper in CSF, which is going to be next week, which defines a, a more a detailed ISA contract. So he, so he actually is uh, working with, uh, uh, for, a more, for a more realistic uh, process, a, a more realistic ISA, where the ISA actually supports downgrading. And in fact, it supports non-malleable downgrading. <clears throat> and, so, 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 the, so the original work uh, didn't have any kind of downgrading in it. You really need downgrading when you build old systems, as I've said multiple times. And in particular, you need it when you're building the operating system. The operating system needs to be able to do magical things, like switch context between different processes. And so to do that, it needs, to, it needs some control over, over downgrading. So what you do is you make the operating system running at the level of some very trusted principle. It has then the power to do all of the classification and endorsement it needs to do to the switch context between processes. <clears throat> okay, so let me tell you then about this, this contract that uh, Dan Fung and the rest of us came up with. So as I mentioned, the, the instructions that uh, we were working with were just basically imp except that we augmented him with some extra stuff that we haven't seen yet. So, so we have an imp-like language. But each command has another couple of labels attached to it. So one label was something we called the read label. And the other was the write label. And these are intended to specify how the command behaves with respect to timing. So as I mentioned earlier, we don't want a spec for, for instructions that says exactly how long things take. So instead, we're going to have a specification that just bounds the influences on how long things take. And that, then, then an implementation can change exactly how it does things, as long as it respects those, uh, those restrictions on what can influence time. So the read label. Uh, it bounds the influences on the time taken by an instruction. And the right label, uh, we will call this uh, L sub R, and the right label L sub W is a lower bound on the effects that an instruction has on microarchitectural state. So remember that the instruction set has, has there's, this, there's an ISA, which has things like registers. And then we have microarchitectural state, which probably has things like a cache, and a TLB, and a bunch of other stuff. And we don't want to have to talk about any of that other stuff 
when we're uh, programming. The ISA doesn't doesn't really say exactly what happens when you uh, when you do instructions. What we're going to just assume is that this microarchitectural state is partitioned, or uh, let's say it's labeled. Every and every piece of state in the microarchitectural state has a label associated with it. Just like the, and, and the ISA does as well. And so then the idea is that when you do, uh, when you run an instruction, this write label is going to tell you what parts of the microarchitectural state might be changed by this. And then, so in particular, there might be some microarchitectural state that's not, that, that's public. So now imagine that you're running a, a, a command, an instruction, that uh, is only run if some secret is true. Well, then that command had better not change the public microarchitectural state, because that public microarchitectural state might change the timing of something later on. So the value of that secret might change timing. So that's exactly the thing that we want to avoid. OK. <coughs> And we 
we have microarchitectural state that at the level of the uh, read label, we have two microarchitectural states that are equivalent at the read label, then we're going to expect that we get the same behavior. So, in other words, if we step C, L, R, L, W, gamma 1, E1, and some G, we step to C1, gamma 1 prime, E1 prime, and G1. And the same thing for, for, for uh, the, let's see, this is not C1, what is this one? let's call it. So, <coughs> so for, for I uh, equals both 1 and 2, then we, that we, we assume that the, these two hypothetical commands both step in this way. Then G1 should be equal to G2. Right? If, the, if, if, if we had two microarchitectural states that were identical on the things that could affect the, the command according to the read label, then they take the same time. If they didn't, then we'd be reading information through time. Okay? So that's the read label property. And the write label property. Has, has a similar flavor. It's going to say, <clears throat> so commands um, so, so if we have some label L that is not above LW, And again, we have a, a step occurring. Then the initial microarchitectural state and the uh, final microarchitectural state should be indistinguishable at that level. So that's preventing us from changing parts of the microarchitectural state that aren't allowed for this. And then, and then the, the final key property that we need is what we call single step non-interference. Basically says, in some sense what's happening here is we're thinking about the microarchitectural state in the ISA. And the read label property is telling us something about information flowing through time from the microarchitecture up to the ISA. And the right label property is telling us about information flowing into the, micro, into the microarchitecture. And then the other thing that could go wrong is that the microarchitecture itself is just sort of bleak. Right? What, what, what's, what's going on in here when information is flowing around? We don't want the microarchitecture leaking things from secret uh, locations to non secret. So, that, so that's what the single step non interference captures. So it says, you know, if, if you have two, um, at, at some level L, if uh, two stores are indistinguishable and uh, the microarchitecture is also indistinguishable at the level L, and you have a command. that is stepping to a corresponding uh, configuration. I prime, G I prime, then we shouldn't be able, we shouldn't see any uh, effects we should be able to distinguish the resulting microarchitectural states. So if we were if we were able to distinguish 
So the microarchitectural states resulted from taking these two steps. So this is again one and two. Uh, then we would have learned something about the rest of the microarchitectural state that was at a level that's not uh, supposed to be observable. Okay. So, so, that, so that now gives us a contract for what's going on inside. So, so now we have a contract for what the microarchitectural implementation of the ISA is supposed to do. If the, if, the, if, the, if the actual implementation satisfies this contract, then we can reason about security in a compositional way. So in particular, what we were able to show is that if you have hardware satisfying these properties, then you can reason about uh, information flow soundly for the software and the hardware composed together. So that means you can actually reason about information flow, uh, including reasoning about timing channels at the source level. And that's exactly the thing that we, we wanted. Let me go back to this uh, example that I gave a few minutes ago. And just show you how that plays out, because maybe you're wondering what happened there. So in order to make this type check, we're, we're in a, a high context here. We've observed the PC is high inside of the SIF. And so that places a constraint on what write label we're able to write. <clears throat> so, so the label that we're going to stick on this is L comma H. So we're back in the world where there's just, we're just talking about confidentiality here. So it's just L, L and H. And this, this assignment also exists at LH. Okay? And the reason for that is exactly because we're, we're reading a high variable that's affecting control flow, and so then that has to show up in these two uh, right labels. Okay, so now since the right label is high here, what that means is that the implementation of this, this assignment cannot update low microarchitectural state. Right? So there's no, no low microarchitectural change as a result of those two assignments. And so therefore, it's not going to, and this that statement is something that's going to be low and low, let's say. So it's not, this, the implementation of the statement is not going to be able to take advantage of any changes to cache or, or whatever accelerator, you know, whatever microarchitectural state we're using to implement this. So, uh, and that, that may mean that it's going to be slower. So our implementation may, have, for example, have to partition the cache into, into kind of the secure cache, the high cache, and the low cache. And an instruction like this doesn't get to use things that showed up in the high cache because of some earlier uh, fetch that was done. Okay. <clears throat> so, so that's that. Uh, hopefully, it all sounds appealing. Uh, now the question is, how do we actually build a microarchitecture? that satisfies this contract, right? It's like, we define all these properties, boy, those are kind of hard. People seem to have a trouble building architecture as it is. Okay, well, for that, I'm gonna to switch to slides and uh, tell you about our work on uh, HDLs. What I should do is turn this on first. Other screen? Other screen? Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm.
So now the question is, we have a rule, we have, a, you know, we have some conditions we want our hardware to satisfy. How do we build hardware that actually satisfies it? And so you know, the message I'm going to give you is uh, the, the same message I've always given you, which is uh, programming languages to the rescue. <clears throat> so the idea is, let's uh, build our hardware using a hardware description language that has labels in it. <clears throat> People build the hardware description, they build like, uh, hardware using Verilog and, and VHDL and uh, lately Chisel. These are hardware description languages. You know, when, when you design hardware these days, you, you write something that looks like a program. You know, it, uh, you know, people are no, no longer in the world of uh, so-called uh, pushing rectangles, uh, you know, laying out actual uh, gates. <coughs> so <coughs> we designed this uh, uh, version of Verilog. We call it Verilog, which adds security labels of exactly the kind I've been telling you about into Verilon. And, uh, and more recently, we have a version of the Chisel uh, hard description language, which also supports uh, these kinds of security types. And, so, and Chisel flow incorporates this uh, non-malleable downgrading idea as well. <coughs> so uh, as, I, as I've uh, mentioned, there are a lot of sources of leakage in modern processors. In fact, there's been a whole kind of cottage industry in the architecture community of writing papers that identify yet another time, source of timing channels inside the processor. So, so our goal here is actually just kind of stamp them all out at once so nobody can write any more of these papers. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> okay, so the, as I said, threat models are important. So what we're going to assume here conservatively is that there's a bunch of, the hardware uh, is divided into things that are public with respect to some adversary and things that are not public. And at every clock tick, the adversary gets to see all the public stuff. So they have a very fine-grained view of, of, of timing uh, in the system. So how do we actually do this? Well, as I mentioned a minute ago, one thing that we need to do is partition the microarchitectural state. So people have been thinking about how to build caches that are partitioned between secure information and information and public information for a while. And uh, so we, we didn't invent that idea, but we, what we can do is check that it's done right. Because in fact, uh, some, of the, some of the papers that have done partition cache uh, designs in the past have actually been either unnecessarily restrictive in what, in what they allowed to go in the cache, or uh, actually had uh, uh, bugs that don't, you know, allowed uh, leakage. So, so here's what a, a partition cache might look like in Verilog. And as you can see, it's not one of the world's most beautiful languages. Um, and it, it has a, a, the semantics of variable are quite exciting. And like if you, do the, if you assign a 32-bit thing into a 16-bit thing, Verilog just says, OK. It doesn't really tell you what happens. Which 16-bits got there? Uh, you shouldn't do that thing if you didn't want to. That's that question. So it's kind of like C, but worse. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so this is the kind of code we want to write. And the idea is that we have a, a cache that has a bunch of different rows corresponding to different addresses. And then we have a bunch of different ways, because this is an associative cache. And so uh, different addresses might be uh, located in the same row, and, and, and the, the cache will figure out which way to stick it in normally. But now we're going to have a a restriction that we're only going to put sensitive information into some of the ways, uh, uh, in this case the ways D2 and D3, and the public information will go in the, in the green side. Okay, so here's how we would code this up in Verilog. Instead of declaring, uh, so if you can 
do the before and after, right? So before we have a bunch of register and wire declarations. After we <coughs> have annotations that say whether information is low or high. So these are just you know, the same kind of security types that we've been talking about. <coughs> and the nice thing about this is we can actually take parallel designs and uh, you know, if they're secure, we can pretty much just stick annotations onto them and, uh, and verify things as they are. And, and that's actually been uh, surprisingly effective. The amount of change that we've had to make to existing parallel designs is pretty small. Now, <coughs> it's a little bit trickier than, than I'm letting on here because there are some labels that we would like to allow to change over time. So, so here we have a cache where some of the ways are annotated as high and some are low. But most of the things in a processor, you don't want to actually tie them to a particular security level. Like you don't want to have a high register because then you can't use it as a low register later. So instead, <coughs> you need to have a language which is expressive enough to capture label the change over time. So, so in here we have a um, we have our cache taking in information in this in this uh, uh, argument in. And in is being used both to write to low security things and to high security things. So that looks kind of problematic. So what, what, the, uh, what the label of in is depends on another, the value of another variable, which is the way variable. Right? The way is to have the way variable telling us which, which way we're supposed to use. OK, so well, the, you know, this is a dependent type. <clears throat> so here's how we, uh, how we do this in, in uh, Sigurd. So it's a little bit different from the way things work in GIF, where we have explicit uh, label and principle types that you can work with. Here, the only kind of data that we have is, is bits. So, uh, so what we do is we introduce functions that can map from bit-level representations of security policies to the actual security policies. So in this case, we have a function called par. Um, I don't know why we call it par. but uh, but par is something which, if you give it an argument of 0 or 1, it tells you low. And if you give it an argument of 2 or 3, it tells you h. So then you can write a little expression and say, well, if you want to know what the label of in is, then you should go to the, the value, current value of the, the variable way, and apply this function to find out. Okay. So, that, so that's a very simple expression that we're writing inside there. And actually, Sekverilog allows more complicated expressions. And, and chisel flow allows even more complicated expressions. <clears throat> the nice thing about this is that compared to some previous techniques that tried to rule out uh, uh, timing channels by doing partitioning of hardware state, we can actually avoid duplicating hardware state for the most part. OK, so what do you get out of this? Well, actually, we can prove that this type system enforces observational determinism. So that's, uh, that's pretty nice. So basically, we show that at each clock tick, the, uh, there's no H information leaking into um, low observable things. <clears throat> okay. So uh, there are some challenges here. One is that we have labels that are being determined at runtime. And so those labels can potentially be information channels themselves. So we need a way to make sure that as things like that way variable change, that we're not creating information <laughs> And, um, and there are a couple ways that could happen. One way we create an information leak is that the label itself is conveying information. A second way that we could, we could leak information is if we had something labeled as secure, let's say, and then we just changed the variable that was determining whether it was considered secure or not. Right? That would be a kind of implicit declassification. And so we want to prevent those. You know, we want the classification to be explicit or happen not at all. <clears throat> so uh, here's a little example of that. Uh, we have a, a, a program which uh, we can imagine running. So we have a, we have a, a public variable p that's labeled low, a secret variable h, and then we have a variable x whose label is actually determined by its own value, which sounds a little exciting, but actually is allowed. Is even useful. So, so then what it does is uh, it says if, if the secret value is uh, is one, 
then we're going to assign x at the point of x. And, uh, and if x is 0, then we're going to assign 0 to p. So if you think about what happens now, let's imagine if p is initially 1 and s is 0. Then we're going to go through a series of steps which result in x being equal to 0. If x, if x is 0, then, uh, sorry, then, then p, sorry, x is, then p is uh, 0 at the end. And if, if the secret is 1, then p is going to end up being 1. So this little piece of code is actually equivalent, to, again, just assigning the secret into the, the public variable. So we want to rule that out. Uh, so the problem here is that when we change the label, when we did this, we did this assignment of x gets one. We're changing labels, and we're, we're considering these to be uh, treated differently. Um, so <clears throat> there is some work in the past which has tried to uh, rule out these kinds of information leakages in uh, dynamic systems with dynamic labels. And so one one of the uh, ideas is what's called no sensitive upgrade, which says that you're not allowed in a secret context update public variables. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's actually even an older idea. It goes back to a uh, paper by Fenton in 1973. Um, and I, there, I have two problems with this idea. I mean, it, you know, it's, 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 it has, it, it has its, uh, its merits. But one is I don't like it when turning on security changes the semantics of a programming language. It's hard enough to reason about writing correct programs if the if the system is kind of covertly damaging your data and preventing you from leaking, then uh, you're going to write code that's wrong. It'll be it'll be secure but wrong. Uh, and 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 the other problem is it actually prevents us from writing the designs we want. So we were not able to use this approach. <clears throat> so so this is so this is actual code from our uh, from our implementation and. It's code that is considered Ill illegal by the NSU criteria because it's updating the way variable, which is a which uh, uh, which could end up being uh, according to NSU, it could be initially a low variable. So if, if way is if way is initially low, then we're updating a low variable inside a secret context, and that would do that. But actually, this is OK, because in this particular case, we're always assigning a value into way that causes it to be high afterward. So it's OK that it gets assigned inside the branch. So we have a more, um, a more subtle program analysis that allows, uh, that, that performs a definite assignment analysis and makes sure that the variables are assigned in a way that makes the security policies consistent across all the different outcomes. And then it turns out to be uh, better than other prior approaches. Um, the, the other uh, thing that we have to worry about here is whether we can actually reason about these dependent labels with enough precision. So in particular, if you think about what happens when we're doing these assignments inside this case statement, the, ca the assignments are taking in, which has the label par of way, and assigning it into something that's either labeled L or H. So for example, when we're assigning it to D0 or D1, we have to ask the question, is part of way something that can flow into P? In order to reason about that, we need to know something about the value of the way. So that means that we start pulling in more sort of conventional program analysis. We need to know that the value of way is either 0 or 1 in order to conclude that, uh, that it can flow into P. And, uh, so, so, so what we actually do in Verilog then is we have a type system of the, of the kind that I've been telling you about, a bit, a bit augmented to handle these dependent labels. But then in addition, we generate a bunch of proof obligations that are things like you know, way is equal to zero or way is equal to one. And we uh, ship all those proof obligations off to, we generate the, the proof obligations using a strongest sort of approximate strongest close condition analysis, and then we ship them off to Z3, which discharges them. And uh, so I'll just show you, show you a, a, a couple of results. Uh, so we, so we <coughs> with Sec we built a MIPS processor, 
full uh, full instruction set of architecture, and it's a, you know, it's a it's a reasonably real implementation as of like 1995. So it's a it's a pipeline processor with all the all the bells and whistles of the pipeline processor, but it doesn't have speculation, doesn't have out of order execution, doesn't have dynamic translation, all the things that make Intel chips a thousand times bigger. Okay, so maybe the thousands of overestimate. <coughs> So, so encouragingly, we were able to take an existing MIPS processor implementation. We were able to add labels to it. We had to modify it a bit. We had to change it so that the, the, the cache was partitioned in the way that I showed you. And the TLB is, is partitioned. Um, but once we did that, uh, it, we didn't have to change very much. Uh, we had to basically have one label per variable declaration. And in the in, our, in chisel flow, actually, we infer most of the labels, of, and so in fact, the, the annotation burden is even lower. Um, and uh, we had to, in some places, that we were not able to convince the type system that things were secure. So we ended up having to add 27 lines of code to the to the processor implementation to establish an extra invariance that would let us convince it that uh, things were okay. And, but th with that, then, we were able to verify the entire processor in two, two seconds, which is a pretty good small number. Like you can imagine people actually using a tool that runs that fast. So <clears throat> when you show this kind of stuff to architecture people, they say, OK, but is it fast? Right. And, and so there are two things that can uh, slow things down. One is that the hardware now has some extra stuff going on. We had to change the design. And uh, th th those added things slow things down. And second, we're going to be, uh, we change the way certain things work, like the cache. And the new cache might not work as well as the old cache. In fact, it can't work really work as well as the old cache, because we divided the cache into parts. <clears throat> so it turns out that the overheads are remarkably low. So it turns out that um, if you compare a, our verified version of the processor against the version that we think is secure, but that doesn't go through the type checker because we didn't add those 27 lines of code, then we're paying essentially no, no overhead. In fact, we actually, yeah, we, our overhead is actually negative. That's, that's kind of an artifact. Every time you lay out a chip, you know, stuff kind of jitters around, and sometimes you just get a slightly better layout. Um, just, just luck, you know. It's like, it's like, you know, sometimes you add an extra line of code to your program and it runs faster. You, know, you ever had that happen? It's a definitely a Okay, uh, and the other question is, well, okay, so it's, so it's as fast as a secure processor, and is it as fast as the original insecure processor? And actually, the overheads here are pretty small as well. So uh, it turns out the floating point unit is the, is the limiting factor how fast you can run, and that doesn't really matter here. So, so but even comparing the part that, the, the stuff that's not the floating point unit, we're still only, you know, like 1% overhead. That's, those are the kind of numbers that architecture people can maybe get behind. There's a, at the software level, there is an overhead, and it's because of the cache. So it ends up being something like a 9% uh, uh, overhead uh, if you keep the cache area the same. So probably the marginal, you know, the marginal benefit of having a bigger cache is larger in this system, and probably you would actually want to allocate more space to cache. So the actual overhead would be less than 9%, and you'd have more space overhead. <laughs> One other thing I wanted to mention is and maybe you've been wondering about this all along and just hesitant to ask this embarrassing question. Aren't there some programs that have to leak information through time? And that's definitely the case. So here's an example. We have a program which is leaving, uh, looping over uh, from, from, from I up, from, from zero up to the number of secrets. And so the amount of time, this, the number of times this loop runs depends on something secret, right? So what do you do about a program like that? Well, in this case, uh, in, if you don't have an upper bound, I mean, one possibility is you have an upper bound with a number of secrets, and you just pad out the execution to that amount. If you don't have an upper bound, uh, then you can do the same kind of padding, but you can do it dynamically. And so we've written, actually, a few papers now about dynamic mitigation mechanisms. That you can stick around in code like this. In fact, the, the paper the paper from PLDI 2012 actually talks about that. Um, so then, in fact, you, so with a dynamic mitigation mechanism, you can prove that, yes, uh, some information may leak, but the amount of information that leaks is bounded. And it can even be bounded to sublinear, uh, a sublinear function of time. So you sort of leak less information as time goes on. 
Okay. So that's uh, that's basically it. Um, I guess you know, if I'm going to summarize the series of uh, talks, I would say that uh, I hope I've convinced you that there are some really interesting problems out there in the uh, in, in, in computer security from both the semantic standpoint and the enforcement standpoint, and that there, there, we really do need to be thinking about new abstractions and new kinds of specifications for characterizing the security of software and hardware. So I think this, I think this is actually a very fruitful area for uh, future research, which I would encourage you to get involved with, because it's, it's pretty clear that languages are part of the solution. Okay, thank you.